Hello and welcome to Dig School, cross-curricular learning themed around archaeology. This session is Safe and Sound, where you'll learn the secrets of safe and happy digging. If you've studied other Dig Schools, you'll have learned some of the secrets of thinking about archaeological evidence and how we interpret it, and you'll have done perhaps some studies of a place that you might be going to dig in, looking at aerial photographs and maps. And if you've done DIY dig, you'll have gone through the process of excavating a one metre square. This session will tell you the last things you need to know to be able to carry out your own archaeological excavation in your school grounds or in your garden at home. So key questions we'll be looking at today are what equipment you need, how to dig the test bit safely and how to report your excavation once you've done it. So you're familiar with all the steps of the test bit excavation. We looked at those in DIY dig. Now we'll be looking at how to make sure you can enjoy that, keep it safe, and that the finds you make will be recorded for others to use in the future. So first of all, what equipment do you need to dig a test pit? Uh, sometimes archaeological excavations seem to have huge amounts of kit on them. Do you need a rugged Land Rover or a transit van loaded to the gunnels just to dig a tiny one metre square test pit? Have a look at all these possible pieces of equipment and in your workbook, put them into groups in order of priority. There's one column for the things you absolutely really have to have. There's another column for things that are really very, very useful, but you could probably just about manage without them. And then there's another column for the things that are handy if you happen to have them, but actually you can manage without them. So here's those three columns and put all of those pieces of equipment into those lists. OK, so how did you get on with that? Well, going through that set of equipment, in essential, is a spade. That's probably the most important thing. You do need a reasonably heavy piece of equipment with a sharp edge to cut through the turf uh, and then uh, loosen up the soil and get it out of the pit. It's also pretty essential to have a shovel. You need something to get the soil out of the pit. A spade is very flat and the soil tends to fall off the edge. So you need a spade and a shovel. Most people with a garden will have one of those. Um, a two metre hand tape or a 30 centimetre ruler. The test bit has to be one metre square because it's important that everyone's digging pits the same size because then we can compare the amount of fines you get. So you need to be able to measure the test pit precisely one metre square. So you'll need either a ruler or a, a hand tape for that. A couple of washing up bowls. You will need to clean your fines and all fines apart from metal and glass and very delicate pottery need to be washed clean with water. Two bowls, one for clean water, one for actually washing the dirty fines. An old toothbrush, absolutely essential for cleaning those fines. Don't use your current toothbrush and don't use the toothbrush you've used for fines washing again after you've used it digging a test pit. Plastic resealable fines bags, you absolutely have to have these. Once your fines are completely dry, you'll need to put them in a resealable fines bag labelled up so that you will know in the future where they came from. And if you need to send them off to be an, to an expert to be identified, they'll know where they're from as well. And they won't get confused once they're out of your sight. A permanent marker pen is something else you need to mark up that fines bag. Permanent marker pen so that the marks don't rub off. And then a pencil to fill in your record booklet as well. Very helpful. Well, digital camera or camera on your phone, you really do need one of these. Um, you'll need it for recording the layers you dig through and you'll certainly need it for photographing your finds. But you can probably manage without it during the dig if you absolutely have to. Plastic sheeting or a tarpaulin or something like that to spread out on the ground so you can put the spoil on that. That is going to be very useful. Um, you really will need that to uh, just make sure that the spoil doesn't get on the ground, on the grass. It's a lot easier to clear it up afterwards if you've, um, if you've got a tarpaulin or plastic sheeting there. But again, you can manage without it. 
buckets or a wheelbarrow, something to put the soil in while you're waiting to uh, sort it for fines. Not essential, but very helpful. Certainly a couple of buckets so that you can be carrying on doing the digging while you've got a bucket or two waiting to be sorted. And another one in the very helpful uh, column is a hand shovel. Again, you can manage without that. You can use the spade and the shovel to get the spoil out of the test pit. But as it gets deeper, you tend not to have much room to actually sort of work um, at the bottom of a pit. So it's useful to uh, actually have a shorter hand shovel. And then the useful, if available, but not essential, a garden sieve, if you happen to have one of those with a roughly 10 millimetre mesh, that helps you sort through the soil. But you can do that by hand if you don't have one. A mattock, it's like a sort of pickaxe, only with a flat end, very good for loosening the soil in the pit. Great for digging the vegetable patch afterwards, uh, if you're debating whether to buy one or not. But again, if you don't have one, you can manage without. Six inch nails, a handy way of when you've got the test pit measured out, the nails in the corner and then run string between all four nails. And then you've got a good sharp edge to um, uh, dig, uh, to, to define the edge. You can use the spade to cut through the turf along that string line. So nails and string are useful, but you can manage without. Uh, plastic seed trays, you'll need something to put your fines in, otherwise they tend to get popped on the grass or on a table or in your pocket and then it's very easy for them to get lost or damaged. A 30 metre tape measure, if you do have a long tape, it'll help you make measurements so you can do the map in your record booklet to show exactly where the test pit was. But if you haven't got that, you can do rough estimates and draw a plan of where the test pit was in relation to other features in the garden or in the grounds. Um, and you can perhaps, uh, if you take a long stride, that's about a metre. So you can measure out the rough distance just, just by taking strides. A kitchen paper or old newspaper, really handy to have something like that to put your finds on when they've been washed because they'll help absorb the moisture and that'll mean your finds dry quicker. And then trowel, the last one. Actually, everyone thinks of archaeology as having trowels, but for test pits, you don't often need them. You rarely encounter features that need a lot of delicate digging, which is where you really need a trowel. So just correct all your tables uh, in your workbook to make sure you've got all that right. And now you've got your list of everything you could possibly need with just those eight really essential items and pens and pencils you probably have already. OK, the next uh, topic is how to dig responsibly and safely, health and safety. Um, as archaeologists, uh, the only uh, dead people we want to encounter are the people who were already there before we started. You're very unlikely to find a skeleton in your test, but certainly don't want to be adding to them by digging dangerously. Um, and we certainly don't want any unfortunate headlines like this. So health and safety is really about keeping people safe and making sure that nothing gets damaged. So that's the key things to avoid injury, damage to property. So first question then is where to put your test pit. Um, <laughs> you need to put it somewhere where again it's not going to damage, damage anything or not dig in a place that's recently been disturbed. Um, so you can see in this cartoon uh, there's a, somebody uh, digging the road has hit a electricity pipe, you don't want to do that. And mm, pet cemetery, if you do know of any pets buried in the garden, it's definitely worth avoiding disturbing them. So um, in your workbook, you've got some space to note down five key don'ts when it comes to thinking about where to put your test pit and three do's. <clears throat> OK, so you've had a chance to note those down. Make sure you've got those summarised so you've got a record of how to advise the person who helps you decide where to put the test pit. <clears throat> so question two is how to dig safely. Now, there are a couple of basic principles, really. Behave sensibly and keep alert. Be aware of what's going on around you. And of course, on the subject of what's going on around us at the moment, You'll also need to keep two metres apart from everyone you're dealing with who isn't actually living in the same house with you. 
Now, depending when you're actually doing the excavation, uh, the government may have changed its guidelines about social distancing. So be aware of what those are and observe them if you're digging with someone who doesn't share your home with you. So, uh, so I'm going to go through um, a load of risks now. And in your booklet, note down what you need to do to avoid those risks becoming something that act can actually cause some damage. So the first major risk comes from cables and pipes. Um, the way to minimise that risk is to check where any known electricity, gas, water or sewage pipes are. But do be aware that people don't always know where those service pipes are. And so it's always possible the way you're digging, there may be water pipes or electricity pipes or whatever, just beneath where you're digging. So dig carefully at all times. If you're using something heavy like a mattock or a spade, don't force it too far into the ground. Always go gently so that if you do find a buried pipe or cable, you come up against it, you don't damage it, and then you can record where it is, close the test bit up and either start another one or you've finished your excavation if you run out of time or got very deep. So second thing is safe use of equipment. Uh, there is uh, a certain amount of equipment you'll be using um, and there are key ways of making sure that you can keep safe while you're doing that. First one, always stand well back from the pit when anyone's working in it. Um, if they're bringing their elbow back to use the spade or the shovel, you don't want to get hit in the ribs by their elbow. Um, if they're uh, using the mattock to work into the ground, you don't want to get it hit by flying stones or anything like that. So stand well back, at least a couple of metres from anyone who's working on the test pit. Never ever reach into the pit when someone is working on it. It's so easy to sort of see uh, what you think might be a, an artifact to find and reach in to grab it. Never do that. Always make sure the person who's digging the pit has stopped and then reach in to have a look at whatever it is so that your hand doesn't get hit with a spade or whatever. You reach in and they, um, they bring the spade down. And never overfill buckets or overload the sieve if you're using one um, so that you don't strain your back when you're lifting things up. You know, be aware of your strengths and your limitations and work within them. If you do have a mattock, uh, it's probably the most dangerous piece of equipment, though it is very effective. Um, never hold it with the metal head utmost. Um, Sometimes the metal head gets loose and if you hold it with the head upwards, the metal head can slide down the handle and hit you on the hands. Or if you're swinging it up in the air uh, and it's really loose, it can fly off the end and hit someone else. So always keep the metal head of the mattock below the handle. Either have it level or have it so that the head end is lower than the handle. And if you are using a mattock or indeed anything where you've got those stones flying around, use safety goggles or glasses or sunglasses, um, something like that, just to protect your eyes. So third hazard then is tripping, falling, slipping. Um, the test pit itself, as it gets deeper, will become more of a hazard. You know, when it's 10 centimetres deep, it's not very dangerous. You get down to a metre, it's quite a big hole to fall into if you should uh, slip. Uh, and uh, fall in. One of the ways to avoid doing that is to keep site tidy at all times so that you don't trip over equipment that's got left too close to the edge of the test pit. Keep the area within two metres of your test pit clear of anything that might be a trip hazard and that includes the spoil heap. If you possibly can, keep the spoil heap a reasonable distance from the test pit so that you're not having to climb over it when you're walking around the test pit. And on the subject of walking around the test pit, always walk around it. Do not jump across it. Um, you might be tempted to demonstrate your athletic prowess by jumping across it. It is only a metre. We can probably all jump that. Um, and if you do jump across it and uh, slightly undershoot, you will fall into it. And even if you make it across it, you may damage the edge so that the next time somebody walks around it, the edge might. 
generally don't run on site um, and also be aware that if it's been raining um, or you've got a lot of water from fines washing on the grass or on the plastic sheeting or the tarpaulin that may become slippery as well and be another trip hazard. On the subject of uh, things getting wet from the rain, weather is another possible source of risk. Um, it's cold. Um, a great way to warm up is by digging. It shouldn't be too cold in, if you're digging in the summer. Uh, if it's wet, the priority really is to keep the paperwork dry. Um, you can dig through drizzle if you want to. It's no problem um, as long as you keep the paperwork dry. If it gets really heavy rain, stop digging because you won't be able to work effectively in the rain and you might not see something which needs to be uh, treated carefully like a delicate piece of pottery. If it's sunny, watch out for sunburn, of course. Use a hat or sunblock as needed. Um, and if it's hot, um, watch out for heat stroke. Um, or indeed, if you're just working very hard and getting very hot, watch out for heat stroke. Keep hydrated, keep drinking, and take breaks in the shade um, to cool off whenever you feel you need them. So another hazard is overhead hazards. It's very easy when you're looking down to think about hazards on the ground or in the ground, um, but actually there are things above you as well. It's easy to forget them. The best way to avoid these sorts of hazards is to make sure you've sighted your test pit away from any overhead hazards, uh, like sort of trees, um, walls or property boundaries. Um, certainly don't put the test pit near a wall, something might fall off it, or indeed you might actually undermine the wall. Um, so and the same reason, property boundaries, you might undermine the footings of them. Uh, keep away from trees. The roots will get in the way anyway. You might damage the roots, that will damage the tree. And again, there might be um, something in the tree that might fall out of it, whether it's bird feeders or uh, um, something else that somebody's put up there, or even a large and hefty apple can uh, make quite a bang on the head if it hits you wrong. And don't dig below a metre 20. Legally in the UK, any excavation below a metre 20 has to be shored up and there isn't space to do that in a one metre square. By the time you get to that depth, it's just not safe to carry on. And sometimes if you're digging on loose soil um, where the edges are crumbling, and particularly in sand, if the edges of the test pit start to crumble uh, and don't seem very stable, then again, stop digging. Sharp objects, um, be aware, of course, that there may be sharp objects in the ground, broken glass or uh, bits of old tin and metal are an obvious source of sharp objects. But actually, even when you get down into lower layers, um, uh, artifacts made of flint, for example, can be really very sharp. Uh, and even if you hit a natural piece of stone, uh, sometimes if you hit that hard with something like a spade or a mattock, that can create a sharp chip as well. So when you're sorting through files, just be aware that there might be something sharp in there. Don't be tempted to rootle through the spoil with your hands. Just do that very gently and carefully. Um, use something else to, if you have a trowel, use that or anything else you've got to sort of rootle through the spoil, break up the spoil and have a look for any finds, but just be careful. And again, don't reach into the pit when anyone's digging it on the subject of sharp objects. A spade can be sharp. Um, uh, some people even sharpen spades. It makes them much more effective to digging, but much more dangerous if you reach into the pit and someone hits your hand with them. Animals. Um, it's lovely having domestic pets around when you're digging um, uh, as companionship, uh, but they can be a risk. Um, just be aware if you know there are pets around in the garden that they may have settled down for a bit of a snooze in the sun because they like to be close to you. And if you don't know and they're just behind you and you get up out of the pit and step back, again, you can fall over them. If you've got an excitable dog who might rush up to you the minute you're moving around, it's easy to trip over that. And again, there's the spoil heap and the test pit are all things that you might fall over or into. Um, also be aware that the animals can be at risk themselves. Um, if you're leaving the test pit unattended overnight, it's worth covering it up if you can. Um, 
and certainly in the morning just check that no animals have got stuck in it sort of things like frogs and lizards and things can very easily get into a test pit and then not be able to get out again afterwards um, I'm sure if you had a cute little puppy like this black one you'd remember to remove it from the test pit um, but uh, and, and all sorts of animals love test pits chickens adore test pits all that freshly disturbed soil that they can scratch about in uh, and we even had a dog once ate a piece of pottery so there's all sorts of reasons for keeping animals a little bit away from your excavation and then the final major source of risk is contamination um, this is the danger of the stuff that you actually find in the pits you may find tins or bottles that may have stuff still in them. Now, a green bottle like this one here, which turned up in a test pit, actually had not to be taken written on it. And that's a sign that it's a Victorian poison mm. bottle. Um, uh, so it says, you know, don't take it. It doesn't mean don't nick it. It means don't drink it. Um, but don't be tempted, uh, even if you find a bottle labeled lemonade, and you might. Um, don't be tempted to taste or, or even sniff anything that you find in your test, but you don't know what's in there. Containers are often reused and they can have quite noxious substances in them. Uh, another possibly dangerous substance is asbestos, which you can see there uh, on the right. It often looks very much like old pottery. It's kind of flat and a bit, a bit sort of uh, unglazed. It can look a bit like pottery. It, characteristically has a very regular pattern of ripples across it. It's not really dangerous when you find small bits in the test pit. It's only really dangerous when it's been broken up and the fibres get inhaled. But so don't break it up and don't sniff it. In fact, don't sniff anything you find in the test pit. And avoid anything sealed in plastic. If you come across uh, something that is a load of plastic around it and especially if it's a bit squishy just steer clear of it if it's on the edge of your test pit work around it if it's in the middle just abandon that test pit whatever's in that plastic is likely to be really unpleasant and could be dangerous um, and it shows the fact that it's there shows the air has been disturbed recently so you won't get any older data out of it anyway so those are the main sources of risk when you're digging a test pit, and that's the way to mitigate against them. So you've had a chance to note those down. So I'm now going to give you is here's a picture of an imaginary test pit dig. Can you spot 10 hazards in that picture? So I'll leave you that to think about. Um, and that's the end of part one. And we'll pick up part two in a few minutes. So we'll start part two of Safe and Sound now. Um, I left you looking at that, um, that imaginary test pit dig to see if you could spot the hazards. Um, and remember, if you can do this, you'll be the person who can keep everyone safe digging your test pit. So let's have a look, shall we? Well, there's a fair few. Um, so first of all, this uh, toddler, um, nobody is keeping much of an eye on them and they're very close to the edge of the test pit. Um, so you need to keep people away from the edge of the test pit and particularly people who are vulnerable like children who might not understand the risk. So that's one immediate hazard there. We've then got someone at the back here who is waving that mattock around with the head of it well above the handle. If that head was loose, they'll hurt themselves. The, the head could slide down, it could hit the hand, it could hit, it, hit them on the head or fly off and hurt someone else. Uh, we've also got a pipe has been discovered here and look, there's a break in it. So clearly uh, the person digging that uh, didn't dig carefully enough or gently enough hit that pipe with that hand mattock they're holding uh, and it's broken and starting to leak water. And in fact, you can even see as well, there's some chips flying up from it as well. Now those chips could easily have uh, flown into someone's eye and hurt them digging there as well. So that's another hazard. And then we've got stuff very close to the edge of the test pit, the 
spoil heap is very close to the edge of the test pit. It's, uh, there's not enough space really to walk between the spoil heap and the test pit without either walking on the spoil heap, in which case you're at risk of uh, dislodging spoil, which will then come down and perhaps hit someone if they're working at the bottom of the test pit. And you've got that brick on the edge there. Again, that could fall in and hurt someone if they're working at the bottom of the test pit. That's not so dangerous when it's only 30 or 40 centimetres deep. If you're down a metre below and a brick falls on you, you're going to get hurt. And there's a pet. Now the cat's obviously really pleased to see there's someone there rubbing up against them, looks very happy. But again, it's a hazard to be aware of. Just be aware there's a cat in the garden. Make sure you know where it is. Make sure you're not going to hurt it and it's not a risk to you. And then this person here, well, they've been a bit careless, haven't they? Um, definitely a bit sunburned on the shoulders, well, on everywhere there, um, which is not great. And you can see they're hot and they're sweaty and they're flushed. They've got overheated. They will almost certainly be suffering from heat stroke. So again, another hazard there. And then here we've got someone who's found a bottle in the test pit and they are giving it a good sniff to see what it is and almost perhaps thinking they might taste it. Again, definitely a dangerous thing to do there. And then finally, the 10th hazard is really just the mess around. Uh, you know, there's the old cups of tea, you want lots of cups of tea and snacks and biscuits and so on when you're digging. You really need that to keep your energy up, but you don't want to be leaving stuff around the edge of the test pit. That shovel, if someone treads on the um, uh, on that, or the handle will fly up and might hit them. It's easy to trip over that and fall in the test pit. The fines trays are right on the edge of the test pit. You just need a lot more clear space. So how many hazards did you get? Give yourselves one mark for each one you spotted and a great pat on the back if you spotted eight or more of them. So now you know a bit about the risks of digging, you're in a position to be able to fill out a risk assessment. Now this is a real skill to be able to do this and there are sort of long courses on doing this and people will do a lot of training in this. But it's a good idea just to be able to have a, have a think about how to do that. It's a useful skill to be able to think about. So in your booklet, you've got a blank risk assessment form. So have a think if you can write down eight possible risks of test pit excavation. In case you're having trouble getting started, I've just put in one here. So damage to utility cables and pipes and drains when digging. We looked at that serious, um, it's a, the likelihood. Um, so all of these risks here are uh, ranked on between one and three, um, uh, with one the least serious and three the most serious. So here, what's the likelihood? Well, it is possible. Um, so the likelihood is two. Um, you should have checked whether there are any pipes and cables, but people don't always know. The severity, put that at the top, um, at three. Um, if you do damage an electricity, gas, water pipeline, that's uh, the consequences of that can be quite severe. And even if it's just someone's internet cable, that's a nuisance. Uh, and then to work out the risk rating, you multiply the likelihood by the severity. So two times three is six. So see if you can think of seven other risks from what we've looked at. And write those down on the uh, under the risk column. And have a think as well about what's the likelihood, what's the severity and what you think the risk rating might be. Okay, you've had a few moments to do that. So let's have a look at the ones that we've come up with. So here we've got those here, damage due to cables already looked at. The second one is injury from unaccustomed and dangerous activity. So that's really about using equipment. It's things like blisters, strained muscles and impacts getting hit by things. Uh, the likelihood is quite low, really. Um, it happens not very often. The severity, you're unlikely to get very severely hurt, so we put that as two. So the overall risk is two there. 
tripping or falling. We looked at that um, uh, quite a bit. Um, the likelihood, well, that is the sort of thing that does happen quite often. People don't concentrate or you've got people around uh, who, who aren't looking what they're doing. We've got a bit of mess around. The severity, again, you can hurt yourself quite badly tripping over, particularly if you fall in the test pit, particularly if there's something, uh, you know, like a brick or something at the bottom of it. So that's a two for severity. So the overall risk rating for that, we've given that a four. Sunstroke, dehydration, exhaustion, exposure. Well, you're digging in a domestic setting, whether it's school or whether it's at your home. Um, so uh, it's easy to make sure you've got plenty of drinks and you've got probably a certain amount of shade and you've got other people to keep an eye on you. Um, it's a reasonable likelihood if you don't take any um, avoiding actions. The severity is not too serious. You're not going to end up permanently injured for any of these. So the overall risk is two. Injury from overhead hazards, we looked at that. Relatively unlikely, actually. And the severity is, again, uh, fairly small. So that's just an overall one. Cuts from sharp objects in the ground or from digging equipment. Again, it is quite likely. Um, unlikely to hurt yourself badly doing that. So that overall is a two. It should be a two. Sorry, it's a mistake there. So two times one is two. And then injury to or from animals, likelihood actually is fairly low. Um, severity, again, fairly low. So that's a one. Um, and then poisoning from substances encountered while digging. Again, actually very unlikely. Severity, well, it depends what it is. So we put that in as a two. So the overall risk there is a two. Now what I'd like you to do is write down in the risk mitigation column what you can do to minimise those risks. So to reduce the risk, uh, the harm that's likely to result and the likelihood of that risk occurring. So you're looking at reducing both the likelihood and the severity. What would you suggest people do? Uh, again, we've been through this, so fill in those columns. So you've had a chance to fill in your mitigation measures columns there. And there's the ones that we'd suggest there. So have a look at those and note down anything you've missed so that you've got a good risk assessment for your excavation. And there's another line just at the very bottom on your workbook in case there's something specific to your site which you think is a risk you can then risk assess it yourself. How likely do you think it is? How severe would the outcomes be? What's the overall risk rating? And then how would you mitigate that risk? So we'll now just remind you that there's a health and safety guidelines summarising all of that on the Dig School website um, that you can have a look at. Uh, on the recording your dig pages. And on the subject of recording your dig, the final thing we're going to look at is how to report what you've done and found. So this is on the Dig School website uh, where you'll go to the recording my dig link there. When you get to that, you'll see there's a number of fields. So you simply enter this information. Uh, and very little of it's actually compulsory, um, but the more information you can give us, uh, the more we can tell you about what you found and the more value what you've discovered will be to other people. So uh, we'll need your name, first name and your last name of the sort of lead person on the dig. Um, we'll need the first line of your address. Um, so that's just your house number and the street or your house name and the street. Um, your postcode as well. And we really do need this information because we need to know where the excavation was. Um, and then the site code. This is made up of the postcode, the first five uh, characters of your address and the last two digits of the year. So you can see here the site code, which is the postcodes AB23CD. Um, the uh, address is 27 High Street, so it's 27 HIG, the first five characters, um, and 20 is the year. 
and then a description of the test pit location. So you've given us the postcode, um, just the description, the same description that you wrote in your record booklet. And then you'll need um, a map or plan showing the site location. You'll have put this into your record booklet. So a photograph of the map you draw in your record booklet is absolutely fine for that. So it should be quick and easy to upload. Um, a national grid reference, um, ideally with at least eight figures. Uh, you should be able to get this off your phone. And again, the GPS coordinates, you should be able to get that off your phone. It'll just help the record have a precise location of where your test pit was. Um, some information about how deep your test pit was dug to. Uh, so at the end of the digging, you had to record the depth of it when you did section drawings. And then a uh, the number of contexts you excavated as well. And then a description of your test pit excavation, a note of anything exciting or significant that you found. Um, then photos of your test pit, um, a few general pictures and photos of the pages from your record booklet as well. Photos of your finds. It is really important we have good photos of your finds. Um, and suggested identification. I'll have a look, we'll have a look at that in just a minute. Um, so that uh, for those finds you have been able to identify, we know what you found. And then any final thoughts, um, anything else you'd like to tell us, maybe uh, the final conclusions from your test bit record booklet or anything else you'd like us to know. So on the subject of a picture of your test pit, a picture like one of these just helps create a permanent record of where your test pit was. So you can see from all of these, there are permanent features like buildings or even on a playing field, the goalposts probably won't be there forever, but it gives some way in a field that might not have many other features of just getting some evidence for where that test pit was. So it, a general view of your test pit that helps would help someone else locate it is really helpful. So if you've taken those, upload those. And then photographs of your finds. We really, really need um, good, high quality photos of all of the finds after they've been washed and have dried, laid out so that no finds are overlapping any others, so we can see all of those finds, um, and laid out also with a label with the site code, the test pit number, if you've had to start one test pit and then stop it because you hit something like a electricity cable and start it again in another place, you might be test pit two, otherwise your test pit will be test pit one. And then the context number, which of those 10 centimeter slices have those finds come from. So you see, here you can see an example of these. Um, if you enjoy it, take a bit of time to lay your finds out artistically. It's really helpful if you can put all the pottery together, all the bone together, all the stone together, anything else, if you can group the finds by type, um, group them by the date you think they might be. Um, so you can see here, you can see there's a scale, there's a ruler in there, just a little six inch ruler, but it's got those scale markings on. There's a label with the site code um, details written on that. And then there's a couple of bits of flint on the left hand side. It's, one's a bit of burnt flint, um, one's a flake, a worked flake, uh, part of the prehistoric tool making. There's then some unglazed earthenware type pottery. In this case, it happens to be Roman, but that can be quite difficult to date. It's very clear that this is it's got a sort of painted color on the surface, which is worn away in places. That's very characteristically Roman. There's then sort of in the middle of the top there, there's some other reddish brown pottery, but actually that's got a really shiny glaze on. So that's much later. It's sort of post medieval glazed red earthenwares. And then on the right hand side, there's um, some blue and white ware and some of that white ironstone china, very characteristic of the, of the Victorian and early modern period. And then at the bottom, there's bone. The other main finds from this context were bone, there's some big ribs, and then some chicken long bones there as well. So you can see what we need is a, fire, a picture like that for each of your 10 centimeter contexts. And also your 
identification of what you've been able to identify. Just a broad period is fine. Um, now, this is a very specialist skill in many cases. Um, there is a pottery identification guide online that you can have a look at, and that's got uh, examples of sherds of different sorts of pottery uh, from the prehistoric right through uh, to the uh, early modern Victorian material. And there are some other resources, very good online sources for identifying finds. Um, so uh, we'll have a look at this in a, a future dig school as well. Identify as much as you can. Um, and then make a clear note of the things that you can't identify. You can even take a separate detailed photograph of those and then you can send those up to us. We can send them on to the specialists. And if we still can't decide for sure, then you can send your pottery off to a specialist and it will be professionally identified. So we will look at this a little bit in another dig school after the digging is finished, um, but otherwise um, identify the finds yourself and anything you can't do, give us a shout. We can send it off to a specialist. So that should give you everything you need to know uh, if you've done the DIY dig, dig school session as well. That, uh, this safe and sound one, should give you everything you know. And the more other dig schools you've done, the more you'll be able to contribute your knowledge and your ideas about how to interpret what you found and perhaps something about the place you're digging in as well. Um, if you have any queries, email digschool at archaeologyuk.org.uk. Um, and if you are tempted to have a go at the digging, again, just get in touch, let us know, or just get on anyway. Um, we'll be, there'll be someone available online all the time uh, during dig week, the 22nd of June, for the seven days from then. There'll be someone online then to answer queries on social, keeping an eye on social media if you're using Facebook or Twitter, who can uh, answer any queries you have. And if you just want to get in touch and ask us whether you think you should have a go, then drop us an email. So we've looked at those key questions. You've got a list now of the equipment you need and what you really, really need and what you could have but could manage without. Uh, you know how to dig a safe, test bit safely and you know how to record and report everything that you found. So it's over to you. I hope you decide to have a go and I look forward to hearing what you found. So I hope you've enjoyed this session of Dig School. Um, I hope you enjoy digging if you do it. And if you don't, we'll be looking at the finds that have turned up and writing the story of those. And we'll all work on that together in sessions of Dig School after Dig Week. So thank you very much for enjoying this session of Dig School. See you again soon. Thank you.